This week we're going to be studying the arc of history. We're going to study the history of computing from 20,000 years ago to the present day and into the future. We study the history of computing not just because it's interesting, but also to see where the general trends are going. If we study the arc of history, we can get some idea how we've got to where we are, where we're likely to go next. So we're going to consider this question, if it has any meaning, who invented the first computer? As we go through history, I'd like you to think in your own heads, is this a computer? Where is the line where we suddenly started making computers, if there is such a thing? We're going to go right up to the present day. We're going to look at the possible end of Moore's law, which is the big current issue, and maybe have a little glimpse into the future. This might be quite a long lecture. If we have a break, it may be quite a short one, because we have 20,000 years of history to get through. But I, I hope you'll enjoy it. OK, so let's begin by attempting some kind of definition of what it is we're looking for. So last week, I was a little touchy about giving you any formal definitions of, of computers. We looked at some problems about semantics and so on. As a working definition, I'm going to give you this week Church's thesis. Now, a thesis is not a fact. A thesis, if any of you do a PhD thesis, you'll create one of these. Um, it's a Greek word. Here it is in Greek. Um, it means something put forth. A thesis is a view or an opinion. You don't have to accept a thesis or an opinion, but it's there for you to discuss and, and debate. It's generally used as the working definition of a computer by most modern computer scientists. And Church's thesis is that a computer is a machine that can simulate any other machine if you give it as much memory as it asks for. Okay? So you don't have to have a physically infinitely large memory, but every time the machine asks you for some more memory, you have to, to run into the room and plug in some more RAM chips or give it some more CD-ROMs. Okay? The key thing then is that it can simulate any other machine. So last week I talked about building a machine that you can program to play Space Invaders as a, a good rule of thumb. So for example, a, a church computer is one which can be simulated to play Space Invaders. You're simulating the environment used in the Space Invaders game. So some consequences of that definition means that in particular, a church computer has, has to be able to do certain things because we know there are existing machines that can already do these things that must be simulatable. So this includes a lot of things people were shouting at last week. You've got to be able to read, write, and process data, but you've also got to be able to read, write, and process programs. This is going to be important, especially the, the writing part. Um, computer has to be able to add, and from addition, you can build up the rest of arithmetic. It has to be able to jump has to have a go-to statement. And importantly, it's got to have a particular kind of jump called a branch, which is a conditional go-to. It's an if statement. If something is true within the state of the computation, then you're going to go to a different part of the program. So these are some of the factors you might want to consider as we go through our history of computing. If you want to try and decide where is the red line when someone invented the first computer. So let's go right back to the beginning. Let's go right back to 20,000 years ago. Homo sapiens has been around for much longer than this. About 40,000 years ago, anatomical Homo sapiens suddenly became a lot more intelligent. There was an event called the Cognitive Revolution. Possibly this was due to a genetic mutation and the beginnings of language and hierarchies of conceptual thought, suddenly you see a whole load of things getting invented um, around 40,000 BC. If we've got any Warhammer 40,000 players in here, probably, yeah. The reason that game is called 40,000 is because it's the same period of time into the future as our current state of evolution is from when this happened 40,000 years ago. So within that period, about halfway through that period, we find the oldest possible known calculating device. This is called the Shango bone um, that was dug up in the, the Congo a few decades ago. Um, this has been claimed by some as a numerical device, a calculating device. You can see the bone has markings um, which look a little bit like a tally. If you've ever done tally counting, you make 
in our case, we make groups of five. We make four strokes and a fifth stroke across. There are groupings of scratches on the bone which look somewhat similar to this. Um, some authors have argued that the sizes of the groups are mostly prime numbers between about 5 and 19. And you can cluster these groups together into larger lines, which all seem to add up to multiples of 12. Now, until around the, the Bronze or Iron Age, most people were counting in base 12 instead of base 10, so there could have been some significance to this. That's the base we still use in our time. We have a 12-hour clock. We have 360 degrees in our angles. So people who lived in the Ice Age were just as smart as us, according to the, the co cognitive revolution theory. If you took an Ice Age human and put them in this class, they could study CPU design or, or quantum mechanics or anything we taught them. So it would have not been beyond these people to, to count. You could, for example, be counting animals or any kind of tradable object that you needed to keep track of. Other authors think this is just completely crazy speculation and that the markings are in fact just there to make the thing easier to hold. It might have been the handle of something. It's quite easy for people to get excited about prime numbers and, and patterns. And before you know it, you're thinking that aliens built the pyramids. So this is somewhat, somewhat debatable. But it's possible. OK. So we'll fast forward into the Bronze Age. So when the ice melted, this was a big climate change event. And it enabled humanity to expand and to build cities. And we had the first civilizations as, as the ice melted. About 4,000 BCE was, was the start of this. It's the, the time of biblical creation. It's the time of the invention of writing. Um, and some of the first civilizations appeared in Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, um, the first of which is called Sumeria. So when you build a city, you suddenly have to coordinate the actions of thousands or tens of thousands of people, and you have to invent law and accountancy. Um, probably these machines, the abacus, was used in, in accounting calculations initially, maybe to help raise tax. The king would need to know how much of everything everybody had. Has anyone used an abacus before? OK, a few. I'm going to ask you to play with one of these in the workshops, because they're surprisingly relevant to how we still do arithmetic in a modern microchip. Now, the one you see here is a, a base 10 abacus. At this time, people would have been using base 12, so that everything would have been in sixes and twos. Um, the structure of the abacus, then, there's a series of columns. The columns behave like the columns of numbers that we write today. So on a base 10 abacus, you've got units, tens, or hundreds, or thousands, and so on. Each column's got four beads down the bottom, one bead at the top. The top bead represents five of the little beads, so you, you count by moving the, the lower beads up one at a time. When you get to five, you put four beads down again and you replace them with a, a five bead. It's like a five pence coin um, at the top. Then you put the little beads up again, that will get you up to nine. And then when you go to 10, you put all those beads back and you move up a bead from the next column, okay? So you do addition on the abacus, just like you do long addition by hand, where you write the numbers in columns, you add each column, and sometimes the number will carry. If you get to nine and have to add one, you have to carry the number into the next column. That carrying operation is very important all through the history of computing, even now. We think about what's the best way to do that. So you can do other operations on this abacus as well. You can do subtraction if you start with the big number and remove smaller numbers. You can do multiplication if you've split the abacus into two sections or even three sections and use different parts of it to store different numbers. You can do long division, very similar to long division on paper. Um, and in fact, you can do pretty much anything if you create an algorithm. There are modern abacus hackers um, on YouTube and the internet who are doing square root computations. There are people computing the digits of pi. You can use this thing for pretty much anything you want if you write an, an algorithm. Uh, and I'd encourage you to go and look at Look at some of those videos and see what kind of crazy uses um, people are getting up to. Some of those operations, you need a really big abacus. They've got to hack an abacus this big and make it, and then they, they can compute the digits of pi or square root. OK. When we get to 100 BC, this is 
kind of the end of the, the Greek Empire and the, the building up of the Roman Empire, there was a lot of trade, a lot of clever stuff was still being made in Greece, but the Romans had all the power, and so the, the Romans would come and study stuff in Greece, or they'd buy stuff from the Greeks. Um, it's a little like American graduates, to students coming to Britain to absorb our, our scholarly knowledge today and take it back to their, their new empire. So the Antikythera mechanism, whose video you've, you've just seen, dates from that period. It was found on a boat that was probably travelling from somewhere in Greece to a, a customer in Rome. Um, and what you have here is a, even by modern standards, very complex and very well-made clockwork um, calculation mechanism. There were 37 bronze gears here. Um, all designed in, in integer ratios to one another. And it was used for computing predictions of astronomical, probably astrological events. Um, it can predict the motions of the planets, it can predict the timing of eclipses, and it would also predict the times for the Olympic Games, which had a special religious significance at that time. So the system worked like a, a Victorian planetarium. You would presumably turn a handle, you power it manually, and it would simulate time using real time. You would add advance time in the system and it would simulate the states of these astronomical objects. There's a very interesting question why this technology didn't go anywhere at the time. The, the Greeks and Romans were so close to really computing here. If they'd have decided to use this for their census data or for their their city accounts, we could have had everything much, much earlier. There's a trend in science fiction now called post-cyberpunk, where you take cyberpunk fiction and you push it back into the steam age and the diesel age. As far as I know, no one's done Greek punk yet, but if anyone wants, wants a new thing, here's your chance. Okay. So, from around a similar period, um, we see the first primitive robotics, if you like. Um, this is a, a Roman odometry cart. If you run an empire, like the Roman Empire, you have to build maps, you have to know the distances between places, and it's very important to have accurate measurements of distance. So the odometer, this is the, the ancestor of the device in your car that says how many miles your, your car's driven. Um, it's currently used a lot in robotics. We need to understand how our wheels are moving, how far we've gone in order to control a robot. Um, and it works by counting the number of rotations of the wheels. So what you see here are some, some metal balls up at the top. Each time this wheel goes round, there's a pin on a part of the circumference of the wheel. Each time the wheel makes a rotation, that pin is going to open a little trapdoor and it's going to allow one of those balls to fall down into a container. When we get to the end of the journey, if we open the container, we count how many balls landed in it, and that gives us a measure of distance. Now, this is the oldest one we know of um, from around 50 CE. It's probable these things existed a couple of hundred years before because the Romans and the Greeks were making very accurate measurements for that whole period. So even though we don't have the archaeological evidence, we have documents showing they had some way of measuring those things. It's hard to think of any other way that that could have been done. So. There's an interesting difference here between this and the Greek clockwork mechanism. That the Greek clockwork me mechanism is analog. Everything is continuous. You rotate the gears, all the gears move continuously. This is a digital machine. This is counting the number of rotations. When a rotation finishes, that pin makes a discrete ball fall. Okay? So there's an important difference here between an analog computer and a, a discrete device. It's really interesting to see that it was robotics that contributed this part of the history of computer science more generally. Okay. So, no one in the West really did anything for about a thousand years after that. We, we call it the Dark Ages. But our colleagues in the, the history department don't like this term so much. There's a big movement to try and show all the clever things we did in the West in the Dark Ages, but in terms of the history of computing, we did basically nothing for a thousand years. But there was civilization, and it moved to the east. The, the Roman Empire didn't all fall when Rome fell. It moved to a new capital in Byzantium, and we also saw the is Islamic Golden Age. Um, so all the culture, all the learning, all the books moved from Western Europe to the east. So if we go to Baghdad, um, 
around 850 AD or CE if you like, um, we find evidence of this. This is an automated music player, okay? Um, called the, the automatic flute player. Now, pipe organs, like the organs you get in a church today, are very old. They're much older than pianos or any other kind of keyboard. Um, the, the musical instrument pipe organ goes right back to Greece and Rome, as in this mosaic. Um, at that time, these devices only had white notes. They hadn't invented the black notes, so you only had the white notes, and there was a different system of music where you could play your tunes starting on any of the white notes, which produced a set of modes, which sometimes appear in jazz and um, more technical forms of metal music today. Now, the Greeks could have automated one of those hydraulic pipe organs at the time. Some people have speculated that they did it, but there's no actual archaeological evidence. They could have used similar technology as found in the, the clockwork mechanism we saw before. The first archaeological discovery, we have to go to the Islamic Golden Age and over to Baghdad. So what you see here is something called a barrel organ. Okay? You can see that the pipe is up at the top, the barrel is going to rotate around and there are pins on the barrel, very similar to the pin you get on the, the odometry cart that the Romans were using. It's the same idea. And those pins are going to tap the little levers up there, and they're going to let the air flow into the flute, so, so you can play a tune. Okay. By the time we get to Leonardo da Vinci, civilization has come back to Europe. So this is around 1502. Um, Leonardo da Vinci spent a lot of time reading the work of the Greeks and the Romans, probably from the Islamic Golden Age as well. Um, and he resurrected this idea to make a numerical calculator. Now, this is quite similar to the Antikythera mechanism in, in that it's continuous and analog. What you have here are cogs, again, representing the columns of numbers. Um, they're geared so that when you turn one wheel around 10 times, it's going to make the next wheel turn a tenth of the time. And so you can add numbers to this. If you load a number onto it, the position of each of those wheels is a base 10 number. Everyone's in base 10 now. You load the first number on, and then you're going to keep spinning the wheel um, in the rightmost column to add on a second number. And the total is going to get stored on the set of wheels. This is known as an accumulator architecture, when there's just one state and you're adding in numbers. Okay? It would be different if you had a system where you represented the two numbers that were being added and the total in a third place. What you have here is only one number is ever represented. You load in the first thing you're adding and then you load the second number onto it. That's called the accumulator architecture. We still use this today. So this is an analog machine. It doesn't have the concept of discrete symbols. So for example, if you spin one of the wheels around to the number six, the next wheel along is gonna move kind of halfway between the two values. It's not gonna suddenly move from a three to a four. It's gonna look halfway between three and four. So this is very much in the tradition of the Antikythera mechanism. And it's likely that da Vinci was very influenced by that strand of thought from Greece. This was rebuilt in 1968 when the manu manuscript was discovered and it, it actually works, but it needs modern manufacturing methods to, to make the gears. Okay, if we move on a little to 1652, this is Pascal's calculator, actually invented by someone else a few years before, but everyone calls it Pascal's calculator. There's a law in computation history that nothing with a name on it was actually invented by the person it's named after. Um, Lots of interesting politics there. So Pascal's calculator is, is a little more advanced. This takes that same idea we saw on the odometry cart of having discrete symbols. So in Leonardo's calculator, everything is continuous and clockwork. In Pascal's calculator, the next column sits here, and when your first column gets to 9 and you do the carry, you're going to add 1 to 9 and you get 10. That carry mechanism is going to make a discrete event, which makes the next column turn around. Okay? So again, this is an accumulator mechanism. You put a number on the calculator first, and then to add in a second number, you keep turning the dial on the right or pressing button, now that we're discrete, and it's going to accumulate the total of that. So I have a little video of a, a modern rebuild of this to give you an idea. Let's take a look.
So again, you can see each of these columns is representing a digit. Now the digits are discrete. They either rotate or they don't rotate. So we can always see a digit in each column. And you're going to look out for the carry mechanism. That's the mechanism when a column gets to the number 9, and we add one on. The 9 goes round to 0, but you have to add one on to the next column. Okay? If you think about this timing of the operation, it gives you a clue about the computational complexity of the operation, because you're doing some addition on one column. When you do that add one, something else happens. Now the next column has, has come into play, and that carry process takes time. That's become a big thing all through the history of calculating and computing. So you'll see everything is discrete here. You'll see some buttons. When you press a button, it's going to make a discrete turn of the wheel now, unlike Leonardo's calculator, which was analog and continuous. OK, so here we're, we're loading some numbers on. Each of these is going to spin the wheel. So if we're adding two numbers A and B, the first thing we do is we put number A into the machine. Here we're just loading the first number into the columns of the machine. When we do the addition, we're going to tap away at the keys. Um, you can either tap away the, the unit's key a whole bunch of times, or you can tap keys on the different columns to make the addition. And it's performing the same process that you do with the pen and paper when you add columns of arithmetic together. But you'll see there's this accumulation structure. There's only ever one number stored in the machine. That's called the accumulator. OK, so now we're adding the second number into this. Did you see the carry? Yeah, we got to 9, and it actually did two carries because the next column was on 9 as well. It's, the effect of the ca carry is to ripple across the numbers. And that's going to take time because every time you do a carry, the next column is waiting for the previous column to, to know what it's doing before you can update the next column. So if you have to do a carry like this, OK, they're, they're doing this deliberately now to show off the carry you'll see a ripple as this carry goes all the way across the columns. OK? So this is Pascal's calculator in its modern form. So again, you can convince this to do other operations. As you can with the abacus, you can convince it into doing subtraction and multiplication and, and even long division if you use it in the right way. OK. So, moving quickly on to the Industrial Revolution, otherwise known as the Steampunk Age. So, the Frenchman Jacquard um, was involved in textile manufacturing. You've ever been to an industrial museum here? Um, anyone been to, say, Ma Manchester Museum of Industry? It's a great, great place to visit. Yeah, some good computer stuff in there as well. So, this was the time Engineers were building great big machines for automated weaving, for processing fabrics and textiles um, at an industrial scale. It's the time when everyone moved from the countryside to, to work in the factories. Um, what those people were not able to, to replicate from the previous kind of craftsman industry of textiles was the complex patterns. Um, for example, the, the textiles you see here have got patterns of flowers or paisley or other designs on them. So for a while there was a distinction. Anything with a pattern on it was going to be more expensive because it could only be, be made by a, a, an original artisan craftsman. This is before hipsters. But Jacquard wanted to automate this process so that he could make money making the pattern designs in an automated way. And so he came up with the use of punch cards. Okay? So these are cards. The, each position in 2D space is either punched or it's not. It's a zero or a one. As the cards run through the machine, um, the weaving process of the textiles is done by needles and hooks. And the machine throws the needles and hooks at the cards, and some of those needles and hooks will go through the hole. It's the, the mechanism itself is going through the punch card. And where they go through, they're, they're going to act and they, they're going to form the patterns. Okay? So this artisan craftsmanship was replaced by the machine, doing the same process using punch cards. Okay. So also around this time, this is the Victorian time, the time of the Industrial Revolution, we see the same concept from the Islamic Golden Age in automated musical devices, using quite, quite similar ideas. So if you've ever seen a music box like this, yeah, th this is just the same idea as the, the Islamic flute player. It's a barrel. In this case, it's a spring wound. You're going to wind it up. Um, it's going to rotate a few times until it runs out of power, 
and the pins on, on the barrel are going to trigger these, in this case, metallic um, resonators, a little bit like a, a miniature xylophone. And this is enough to play a couple of bars of a, a melody. So pro probably in Victorian times, they'd have taken this year's trendy opera or ballet, and they'd take the, the couple of bars that were the theme tune from that, and they'd make it into a product um, based around the barrel. In some cases, they put a, a rotating object on the top. You sometimes see these with birds or with ballet dancers, even today in a music box, um, rotating along with the music. So the same technology is found in the barrel organ. Okay, you've probably seen these at fairgrounds. They still exist. Um, it's called the barrel organ because it used this, uses the same barrel technology. It's a rotating barrel with pins that are going to trigger the pipes, just like they did in the Islamic golden age. And there was a, a, a trade in Victorian times of being an organ grinder. An organ grinder was like, like this chap, you'd walk to the high street and you'd pump up your, your organ and it would automatically play, play these tunes um, to make the high street a nicer place. Okay. So all of this technology, the barrels, the punch cards, was, was floating around from the start of the Industrial Revolution, which is where we get to Charles Babbage, who took those ideas and put them back together in another calculating machine. So he'd have been studying Pascal's calculator, all those other devices, and he made the next step in that process. Now, Babbage made two completely different machines, and we have to get them the right way around. The first one was called the Difference Engine, which is arguably not so computer-like because it only does a single thing. This, this machine was a, eventually a commercial success. Um, used right up to probably the 1930s, um, sold a lot of copies. Babbage didn't make the money, it was Schultz who actually commercialized the thing. But it was designed for producing tables um, of the results of an equation. If you ever did a maths exam, do they still do this? You used to get a, a, a book and it has tables of trigonometric functions and some other weird functions. A lot of this is done on the calculator now, but you still still occasionally see them. Um, they were very important at the time for use in shipping. The ships wanted to carry these, these books with trigonometric functions to help them figure out where they were. And they were being made by hand at the time. Um, and so an error in one of your trigonometric tables would be a very bad thing if you're trying to navigate a ship. So there was a big economic incentive to make these tables very correct. So Babbage's difference engine is designed only to compute values of polynomial functions. Okay, you can expand any function just about into a, a big polynomial, and then you, <laughs> you literally turn the handle over on the right, you turn the handle, and the numbers come out of a, a printer at the other end that looks a bit like a typewriter. So even today, we talk about the kind of code that you can just turn the handle if something is, is automated. This, this is where that idea comes from. So. Again, Babbage was very concerned with the carrying mechanism here. What you actually have is a, a kind of parallel computer. You can see there's a very two-dimensional structure to this. So the machine's dealing with, with numbers. Each number is made of a set of digits representing columns, but then there are different stages in the calculation as you, as you progress through it, which are happening as you move physically forward. So you see the digits are being represented vertically, and the steps of computation are being represented horizontally. So this is actually a parallel computer, okay? Or it's a parallel machine, at least. We often think that parallelization is a very new thing that we have to deal with now, but it's right there in the, in the Victorian time. So I just want to give you another video to give some flavor of how this works. Again, look out for the carry mechanism. The great technical difficulty with all of these devices is implementing carry, because you can do a lot of your addition simultaneously. You can, if you've ever tried to do manual addition, not in the way you were taught at school, you, you'd like to look at all the columns and just add up each column by itself, ignoring the carries. But then you have to deal with these numbers coming in by carry later on. So you'll see the dynamics of this have a very kind of rippling effect. You'll see that a bunch of stuff happens, and then you get to a carry, and the effect of that ca carry will ripple across the whole machine. Okay. The Lego version is only a, a small part. The whole device would have been much, much bigger than that. And you can see it's the same kind of technology being used throughout the Industrial Revolution. Usually these machines were being used to do physical work. 
you know, the, the, the gears, the cogs, the machinery, this was the steam age. The real engine would have all been made out of brass. It could have been powered either by physically turning the handle or by connecting it to a steam engine. And it would have been covered in oil um, to make the gears go smoothly. So you've, you've got to imagine this thing smelling like a, a steam engine. You know, the, the smell of oil and coal and smoke um, was very much the spirit of the time. OK. So that was the difference engine. The difference engine only computed values of polynomial equations. So it didn't have the ability to be programmed in the way we, we think of programming now. But Babbage's other engine, the analytical engine, did have that ability. And this, this is often claimed as, as the first computer. And this is from 1837. Now, he never actually got this thing to work. Um, as a scientist, he was somewhat problematic. He was a perfectionist. He basically got obsessed with making the carry mechanism work really optimally, and he kept getting distracted making different versions. But the basic design very much existed, and parts of it at least have been rebuilt in, in modern times and appeared to work. Um, this machine is astonishingly modern. It's so modern I'm going to use it later on to teach you how a modern CPU works, because you can see all the parts of a modern CPU. Um, physically embedded in this design. So unlike the difference engine then, this was cap capable of being given instructions in the program, put on punch cards, and in particular, it had these operations of addition, jumping, and the conditional branching. You could do an if statement. You could say, if a number was equal to another number, then go to a different part in the program. Okay? And the effect of that would be to fast forward the punch cards. It would spin the wheel with the punch cards on it, and it would take you to a different line in the program. So you know, this, this is the original steampunk. If anyone's read a book by Neil Stevenson and Bruce Sterling called The Difference Engine, the origin of steampunk is this fantasy that Babbage got the analytic engine to work, and so the computer age kicked off in 1837 instead of 100 years later. So I want to go into this one in a little more detail, because it, it really is so relevant to modern CPU design. The first thing to understand about the analytic engine is that it is an engine. Okay? If you ever get into packing around with car engines, you'll see very similar structures, even now. These would have been steam engines at the time. Um, this is a petrol engine. So a modern petrol engine works like this. It has a cycle of four stages. Intake, compression, ignition, and exhaust, which everybody calls suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. So in the first step, these, these tappets at the top can move around. They're controlled by a rotating shaft um, called camshaft. And as that shaft rotates, it opens and closes tappets at different parts of the, the timing cycle. If you've ever had your car tweaked to improve its timing, this is what, what they're changing. And that timing cycle looks very much like the barrel instruments we've been looking at. It's a rotating shaft with pins on it that makes stuff happen. So in the case of the car, this one opens, uh, it lets stuff in. Um, this part rotates, the piston squeezes it in compression, then the thing ignites, and then the last part of the cycle is to push the, the exhaust out. Okay? And there's an important concept of feedback in the system, where the, the crankshaft, that's the power coming out at the bottom, is connected back to the camshaft. So the, the result of the power cycle is to make the, the camshaft keep going around. And that's how the, the timing stays in place. As you go through the four stages, each stage is making the next stage happen. Okay. It's exactly that principle that we see in the analytic engine. So I'll show you some specific parts of the engine. Um, numbers are represented using decimal positions of gears. Okay. This is a gear, it's got the numbers 0 to 9 on it, just like in Pascal's calculator. The rotation of it stores the digit. So this column is representing the number 2. Okay. Now, an interesting consequence of representing numbers on gears is that when you look at a number, if you want to read the number, you have to remove it from where it was. You, you move the number from a place where it's stored to where it's going, and then it's gone. It isn't in the, the memory anymore. So if, if this column here is the memory, it's storing the number seven, say, and I want to move that number into my processor, I'm going to do it by placing two extra gears here, 
Okay, I'm going to bring those into contact temporarily to do the move. Okay, and then I'm going to spin this thing round. There's a little catch on it here, and the catch is set up so that when you get to zero, the thing stops rotating. So I can spin the first wheel round as much as I like. When it gets to the catch, it'll stop spinning, and I've transferred the number from there to over here. Okay, and Bab Babbage called this giving off, the process of giving a number off one gear moving it somewhere up. So you can see how addition would be done here. I could load the first number onto my processor wheel, and then I'd, I'd load the second number into it. That would destroy the original two numbers, but the addition total of them would have come over here. So I talk about studying history to help see the future. This has actually become very relevant again in quantum computing. Quantum computing has this property that when you look at a number, you, you destroy it or you change it, or it, it can only be in one place at a time. When we do quantum cryptography, the whole point is to move numbers from one place to another in a way that they cannot be copied by anyone trying to intercept them. So if you search around YouTube for stuff about Babbage Engine, it'll often have links to modern quantum computing. You can actually see the, the influence of it. Okay. So as, as with the difference engine, this was a highly parallel machine. All of the digits were physically there in parallel. You could add them. Initially, you could add all the columns up at the same time, like, like you do by hand when you forget about the carrying mechanism. But of course, then you have to deal with the carrying mechanisms and these ripples. And this, this is where, where Babbage spent most of his time um, obsessing over carry mechanism. The so carry was implemented like this. When just like in the Roman od odometry cart, when this wheel has spun round um, a full circle, it will make a, a tappet go off. This is like the tappet you get in a car engine, and it will advance the next column along by a single notch. And then when that column gets to nine and goes round again, that triggers the tappet on the next one, and so on. And hopefully we'll be seeing a lot of this. This is the original design for a CPU, which is very similar to a modern CPU. Really amazingly similar to a modern CPU. This is the CPU, this is the bus, and this is the memory, okay? All, all these gears are storing numbers in RAM, okay? RAM means random access memory. It's memory you can access any part of whenever you like. So most of these wheels are just sitting here, storing numbers, um, until something in our program moves one of those numbers into the CPU. The difference with the modern CPU is we can copy the numbers. In Babbage's engine, the numbers actually move. Inside the processor, you have lots of small machines, okay? There's a whole load of cogs here. Most of them are grouped into quite small clusters, maybe seven to 10, um, gears together, and each of those is a machine for doing something simple. There's a small machine here that does addition. There's another small machine that does multiplication, and so on. And then you have what's called a control unit, and the control unit decides what's actually going to happen. The control unit can either move data out of RAM into the processor, um, it can trigger an arithmetic operation, or it can do a conditional branch. It can look at the value of something and instruct the program to fast forward or rewind according to the results of that. Unlike a modern computer, the program was stored separately on punch cards. They had their own input mechanism. On a modern computer, the program is stored in the same memory as the data. Okay, that's called a von Neumann architecture. This is called Harvard architecture, where the data is sitting in memory, but the program is somewhere else. So in this case, you cannot change the program. You remember the list of things we needed for a, a church computer definition. The program is fixed. You've made it by making holes in pieces of card, but only the memory can change. So you'd have fed in your program on the punch cards, the control unit would look at the patterns in those punch cards and decide what to do, and each line of the program would either say, load something into the processor, trigger one of these arithmetic units, write something back to memory, or do a conditional branch, fast forward the, the punch card. The thing would have run at about one, one hertz, about one operation 
per second if you compare that to the, the megahertz and, and gigahertz we have today. But you can see all, all the components, the memory, the bus, the CPU, the registers, the arithmetic logic unit, the control unit are all there, just like they are in a, a modern CPU. I want to look at the control unit in a little more detail. The control unit is what today we call a, a microprogrammed architecture. So the, the user's program is written on the punch cards, but there's a much smaller program that is permanently fixed into the machine uh, using pins on a barrel again. This is the program that actually runs the CPU. It's the program that says, read in an in instruction, look at the instruction, decide what it means, connect stuff up to the arithmetic logic units and so on. So this is just like the music boxes we saw, it's just like the, the flute player um, from ancient Baghdad. Um, this barrel's going to spin round and it's going to operate that cycle. It's what, it's what today we'd see as instructions like fetch, decode, execute. As this thing spins around, it's gonna, the tappets are going to trigger these levers. These levers have mechanisms that are going to engage and disengage gears and those gears put values in contact with other values that enable them to do the addition or the, the moving of data around. So again, microprogramming is sometimes considered a, a new thing, but it goes, goes right back here. Okay. So to write your program for this, if it had ever actually worked, um, you'd have done something like this. You'd have made poles in a, a paper. If you wanted your program to run forever as a real-time system, you could have made a loop. You could have glued your paper together and it would run in a loop. That's where our modern concept of loop comes from. Babbage never completed the design enough to give us a assembly language for the machine. We don't know exactly what the instructions in these programs would have been. At the time, he wrote his algorithms much more like the ancient Babylonians did by showing the results of them rather than giving the, the program. So the first programs were written by Babbage. They were very simple programs. And he just shows in his text the output of those programs. He shows the steps in an addition or a multiplication and so on. So he worked closely with Ada Lovelace, who was much more into the software side of this. Babbage became the hardware designer, Ada Lovelace became the programmer, and she took these small programs that Babbage had done and created what we now know as software engineering, how to really structure programs and make large programs um, doing very complex things. She also wrote some of the first philosophy of artificial intelligence, thinking about how these machines could replicate cognitive functions later on. There's a campaign to get this made as a Lego set, if anyone wants to log in and, and vote for this thing. That would be great. So look, here's, here's a claim of the first computer, right? Do you think this is the first computer? Have, have we reached real computers yet in this history? Not sure? Who thinks it's not the first computer? Okay, you're not sure. So, yeah, is the analytic engine a church computer? You know, here's, here's some of the things that a computer needs to be able to do. It's got to read, write, and process data. We can do that. It can add. It can jump. It can branch. Remember, we need to read, write, and execute programs. There's a little bit of a glitch here that the program is sat on those punch cards. On a modern computer, a program can modify its own code. You can go into the memory and tweak your own code. So what we actually have here is what's known, known as a Harvard architecture. It's a kind of computing device where the program and the data are separate. So, we now know that you can run a von Neumann architecture on a Harvard architecture by writing a virtual machine program. If you built effectively an operating system program on the punch cards, you could write a program that simulates another machine, a virtual machine. Um, and that virtual machine could store its own programs in, in RAM and then you'd have all the properties. You'd be able to do self-modifying code. Babbage didn't actually do this. Lovelace didn't think about it, as far as we know, but neither do a lot of other computer designers. Um, writing self-modifying code is not a common thing to have to do now, and there are a lot of machines today that are Harvard architectures, specifically things in digital signal processing devices, things you find in your, your TV or your music player, um, are quite likely to be Harvard architectures. And maybe Church's thesis is about potential to do this. Is the device a computer if it 
could have been used to make a virtual machine, even though it actually wasn't. Well, it wasn't actually used to do anything because he never built the thing. So it, it kind of depends, okay? It depends how you interpret Church's thesis or whether you even like Church's thesis as a definition of what a computer is. So a little more technology over time. Um, after Babbage's engine, um, the punch cards became popular all over the place. Um, I'm a musician. I, I like the history of musical instruments. Um, so you can see the same kind of punch cards. This is just the sort of thing that would have gone into the analytic engine. Here it's being used to automatically play a, a church organ. Um, this was called book music. Now this is a little different from the barrel system. The problem with barrel is that you have quite a limited amount of storage because you've got to fit it on a rotating barrel. So those music boxes we saw would probably only play a few bars of music from, from that year's trendy opera. Um, what you get now is the ability to put a full composition, you know, 10 minute organ composition um, could be performed automatically. So by this time we also had pianos um, as well as the much older organs. This is a pianola player piano. Again, you see the piano roll containing the, the punch cards. Tri triggering the piano. You still see these around in a few places. Um, so one in a hotel in China last year. And of course this, this notation, piano roll notation, is, is still around today. If you use a music production program, um, this is Ardo 5, this is the, the latest thing we have, and you see exactly that piano roll notation. You have the different pitches um, occurring over time. That's where our, our modern piano roll notation comes from. Okay. By the time we get to 1890, we had the formation of the company which is now called IBM. Originally the tabulating machines company, then international business machines. Um, this was set up by Hollerith. And he found a market for doing big data analytics on the US census. Um, the American constitution says you have to do a census every 10 years and they'd got way behind in processing this data. It had been building up a, a backlog from millions of people. So Hollerith used some electricity, some mechanical approaches, and he used punch cards. Each record would be stored on a punch card. So you could have Boolean data stored on a punch card, yes or no. You could have integers if you chose one option out of 10 and punch that. And in modern terms, this machine was a a kind of SQL database. In modern terms, it could run SQL commands like select, where, group by for doing aggregation, sort by. So you could compute the average age of people in, in the country, the average income, these kinds of things. So IBM was doing big data analytics in 1890. If anyone tells you that big data analytics is some new thing, tell them to, to read the history books. These machines were very successful commercially. After their success in the census, they got sold to companies and governments all over the world. In particular, they were sold to Bletchley Park, who used them for code breaking in the Second World War, much later on, 50 years later. Um, they were also sold to the German code breaking equivalent of Bletchley Park, the BDIN. Um, and in a really dark piece of history, this is the CEO of IBM, um, Thomas Watson. If you've ever heard of IBM Watson, is a new big data analytics thing. IBM just chose to name their system after this guy. And here he is sitting with uh, Hitler, selling some of these machines. Um, he was given an award for services to the Reich by Hitler. And there's evidence these machines were installed, not only installed in the concentration camps, but the IBM consultants were visiting there every month to maintain them. They also devised a, a data representation scheme. So they had code number four for Jews, six for gypsies, number two means dead in the gas chamber, number seven means has to be rounded up. When the Nazis went to round up prisoners for these camps, the lists of names were being produced by these machines using the same technology as the US census of the 1890s. Okay. Talking of Nazis, arguably the first electronic machine was built by this guy, um, the Nazi German Konrad Zuse. He was not a member of the Nazi party, but he collaborated with them. He took their research funding and he built this machine for military use by the regime in 1941. 
This is a hybrid machine, again, like the, the IBM system. It's a mixture of electrical and mechanical um, components called relays. It's got a mechanical memory, um, like Babbage's engine, containing 64 locations of 22 bits each, using binary representation. It was only recently shown to be theoretically a church computer. Um, you could make this into a church machine if you did something very strange and ran it for a 10,000-year period and implemented stacks of virtual machines on it and so on. So potentially this could have been a, a von Neumann architecture, but very much in theory, and again, he didn't actually think of doing that. If you want to give him the credit, you probably want to give the credit to Babbage and Lovelace as well, because their machine could also have done this had anyone thought of building a a virtual machine on it at the time. Okay, a um, couple of years later, again during the war, we saw electronic machines being constructed in Bletchley Park. This is the Colossus, designed by Tommy Flowers, um, not by Alan Turing, as many people think. This was based on valve technology. This is more advanced than the electromechanical relays being used by Conrad Zeus. So a valve is a purely electronic system. It's faster than a relay. This thing could be partially programmed by rewiring. You could write a program by connecting things to other things with the wires. If anyone's ever used a, a patch synthesizer to play music where you create your effects by wiring things to, to other things, it was that, that kind of technology. And again, as, as with Conrad Zeus's machine, this was very recently shown to theoretically be church computable, but only via very obscure technicality. In this case, you'd need to have built 10 of these things and wired them together in a really specific way, again, to create a virtual machine architecture and so on, which wasn't actually done. This was actually used for a single purpose. It was to break, um, not to break the Enigma, to break a different German cipher um, called Fisch or, or Tunny. The ciphering machines, by the way, were basically typewriters with a Pascal's calculator stuck on the back. There's a very clear trajectory of technology all the way through these, these calculating machines. Okay, the American effort in the war was focused on this machine called ENIAC, um, which again was electrical. So you can see here a picture of the programmers. This is how they did programming, by connecting things, connecting sockets together with wires. That's how you implement your program. Um, again, this was a valve machine. Um, this time we've got 20 by 10 decimal digits um, as CPU registers, um, or up to 100 in expanded memory. This thing could do about 5,000 instructions per second, so five, five kilohertz processor. Um, it was supposed to be used during the war. Uh, maybe it was used a little bit for things like missile trajectory calculations, but it really came into use after the war when they went straight on to designing the hydrogen bomb, which required lots of physics calculation. So again, this was technically a Harvard architecture because you can see them programming the wires. Once you fix the program with those wires, um, that's the fixed program. The program can't modify itself. So as with the other machines, there was this unrealized potential. You could, in theory, have written a virtual machine on it, um, which would have given you the, the full power. But until 2016, we didn't think anyone had done that. In 2016, someone dug up a, a, note, a notebook from this period, and they found that the programmers, so it was this, this gang of programmers here, um, probably Kathleen Antonelli, Jean Bartik, Francis Hoppleton, Marilyn Metzer, Francis Spence, and Ruth Teitelbaum. Some or all of these programmers, not in any formal way, not in a way that was published as science, but they got sick of having to write programs by moving these wires around all the time. And they decided just to make their job a bit easier by building that virtual machine. They created a system with the wires so that the program could be stored by flicking little switches um, instead of having to move wires around all the time. So all through this period, programming was, was considered a, a kind of secondary activity, and the excitement was all the, the men doing hardware, and you had women who were employed as programmers. They come out of this tradition we saw last time of human computers, when you had the, the rows of women doing calculations, but the women you see here are not just doing calculations anymore. They've become programmers. They're writing software. And through this process of writing that software program, they were the people who actually created this virtual machine, which then gave us the, the full power um, 
that we need for a, a church computer. There's a, still a bit of a catch because the, the switches they created were still technically ROM rather than RAM. So the program still can't modify itself. Again, does anyone really care? But they, they created one level of virtual machine. If they'd have gone to a second level and used the program in the switches to make something where the program was in RAM, it would have obviously get there. What's interesting is that they didn't think much of what they were doing. They just did this as a hack. They just got sick of moving the wires around. So they wrote this, this program, which turned out to be a, a really key idea. Um, in the development of virtual machines. The ENIAC was also where we had the world's first bug. Um, it was a moth which got stuck in some of the electronics and they, they logged it in their logbook. That's the, that's the actual bug um, which they sellotaped into their logbook. Okay, so after the war, we now go to Manchester and you should go to Manchester and see this because it's there in the, the Science Museum. If anyone's in the Computing Society, okay, you guys need to organize a trip, coach trip to Manchester to go and see this thing. Um, so this was a fully electronic machine again, um, along the lines of the, the modified ENIAC, but Manchester's claim to fame was this is the first time we had the program stored in the RAM instead of in the ROM. So on the ENIAC, you wrote your program in that second version with the, the switches, which are a kind of ROM. But here, the program is stored in the same memory as the data. So if you really care about writing self-modifying code and all that, this is the first time we, we saw that level. So by the time you've got here, this is indisputably a, a modern computer. You could, you could write Space Invaders on this. Um, of note is the, the way memory was implemented. This is a cathode ray tube. It's a, green screen, you, you can see it visually, but it wasn't used as primarily as a monitor, it was used as the memory, because cathode rays have this property that if you zap electrons onto them, um, and they glow, and they keep glowing for a short period of time, okay? You can use that as a memory. Wherever you zap with an electron, that thing's getting stored, and if you read it back and then zap it again, you can keep memory stored there. So this green screen, it's still sitting there, you can still go and see it in the rebuild. You'd have seen quite random looking patterns of green dots on that screen, and that, that was the memory, you could see the memory. I mean, there are simulations of this now that you can hack to make you play Space Invaders and so on on, on the screen, actual Space Invaders, but the, the original point of that green screen is, is the memory storage. That's the origin of the green screens we still have today. Um, in the 1980s, we used to program on monitors that had a button. You could flip them between being color mode and green mode, and the green mode would give you a green screen that looked just like that, because it's what people were used to, it's what they like. So we did a lot of our programming in the 1980s on these black screens with green text, and that's why we still configure our Linux terminals to look like that today, because it's what we're used to, and it goes all the way back to this, called the Williams Tube, the first CRT device. So go, go to Manchester and have a look at this. If you, if you go with enough of you, they'll put on a tour and they'll, they'll get some really old guys who are still hopefully alive um, involved in building the thing, or at least in restoring it. I'll tell you how it really works. So I've not mentioned Alan Turing yet. A lot of people credit Alan Turing with the invention of the computer. I would somewhat argue against this. Alan Turing has a massively politicized biography. Alan Turing, hero or fraud? When I was an undergraduate, he was barely mentioned at Cambridge because we thought the Cambridge lab was run by a guy called Morris Wilkes, who was one of Turing's rivals. He'd led a different team in World War II, built a, a, a different computer. And we all thought that Turing's history was kind of being erased from from our studies because of this, this rivalry. But a guy called Andrew Hodges wrote his biography in the 1980s, um, which made him very famous. We've more recently seen films about him, and he's become a kind of mythological figure. The myth of Alan Turing is that before the war, he invented the Turing machine as a piece of mathematics. Then he went to Bletchley Park, and he built the Turing machine. Uh, with paper tapes, and he single-handedly broke the Enigma code, and then he went to Manchester and built the, the Manchester Mark I, and famously he was gay, and at the end of his life the British government hunted him down for being illegally gay, and injected him with female hormones, and made him go crazy, and then he killed himself by eating a poisoned apple, like the, the apple from the Snow White story. You know, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great story. Um, 
how much of that is actually true? <laughs> so I met Andrew Hodges a few years ago and we talked about his book. So that, that book has its own history from the 1980s. There was, there was a time in the 1980s when the, the gay rights movement um, was very political. They were fighting a very important cause. And as part of that movement, which Andrew Hodges was a, a leading member of, they, they really needed to create a, a gay hero. They needed to say, you know, look at the contribution our community has made. Look at what the British government did to all of these people. And they needed a figurehead to, to represent it. They wanted to get him pardoned by the government and to change the law. Um, and it was very convenient to settle on Turing, to build that myth around. If you look at what Turing actually did, he has this habit of showing up about a year after other people have just done something and then taking all the credit for it. There are still people in academia today who have a, a knack for doing this. You know, these communities like deep learning and data analytics. So the definition of, of the modern computer, which people credit to the Turing machine, was done by Church the year before. Church's paper was already published when when Turing was. Sometimes it's called the Church Turing thesis, so he, he gets his name attached to that a year after Church had already published the thing. Um, remember, all of this is happening 50 years after IBM was doing big data analytics on the 1890 census. They were doing that before Alan Turing was even born. When Alan Turing arrived at Bletchley Park, they were already running IBM machines to break the code. The code had already been broken when Turing arrived at Bletchley Park by the Poles. They'd been reading the Enigma machine for seven years. So, sure, he made some very important contributions to improving the system. All through the war, both sides were constantly upgrading their codes and breaking them and upgrading them again. So he certainly made some, some of the steps in there, but so did the other hundreds of people who worked at Bletchley Park as well in a big, a big team effort. The ENIAC was built in America during the war with no knowledge of Turing's theories, as far as we know, but it was explicitly based on Babbage's designs. The ENIAC designers were, were steeped in reading Babbage. And then after the war, Turing arrived a year after the Manchester baby was built, and he wrote the technical manual for it. Um, so, sure, he made some contributions, but you have to read his biography through the lens of history. You understand. You have to understand why, why this biography came to be the way it was. I think Turing actually was a genius, but for a completely different reason. If you actually read his paper, which is called On Computable Numbers, this is the paper that is credited as inventing the computer. <laughs> the title of the paper isn't about the computable part, it's about the numbers. What he actually does in that paper is he creates an alternative way of defining the real numbers. If you talk to your friends in the mathematics department, they have this really bizarre way of defining what a real number is, um, and it makes them computationally uncountable. There's a bigger infinity of them than there are of the integers. What Turing did was he created a different concept of the real numbers um, called the computable reals, or we should call them the Turing reals now. We should give them the letter T, like you have the letter R for reals. And he makes the real numbers countable, but not computationally innumerable. And this is some of the most beautiful mathematics I've ever seen in my life. Um, and even now, it's not fully understood by everyone. You talk to your colleagues in the math department, they've probably never heard of it. But we have a better definition of real numbers than the math mathematicians do. We define real numbers as being programs, anything you can compute on a device. And this is really beautiful work. And there's a reference to his paper here if you'd like to check that out sometime. So. Who invented the computer? Somewhere along that process, the computer appears to have been invented. So the modern concept of computation, again, you can argue whether you like it or not, it was defined by Church's thesis. That's a concept, not a natural machine. Certainly by the time we get to the Manchester baby, that is indis indisputably a computer. This ENIAC system is very interesting. The initial version of ENIAC would have had the potential to be a computer if it was programmed in this virtual machine way. And in 2016, we found out that its programmers almost did that. They got to the point of putting another layer of programs in the ROM, at least. They'd have still needed a second virtual machine on top of it to get to a RAM program. But you, know, you could also have done that with the Colossus and the Zeus machine, um, but nobody did. You could even have done it with the analytic engine. It has the architectural potential to run as a virtual machine. But if you're going to make that argument, 
You could do this on any of these devices. You could take an abacus and you could write an algorithm for running a virtual machine on an abacus. You know, people have actually been calculating since probably 40,000 BCE. They've been using the abacus, mechanical calculators, paper pens, clay tablets, bones, rocks, their fingers, and natural numbers in their heads. You don't even need a physical device if you can do it in your head. And all of those systems are theoretically church computers because they can simulate any machine if they're programmed in a certain way to do that. So we've really always had computers and church was just the first to notice.